want to uh, ask you to join me in singing to the work to the work as we begin this time of ordination. To the work, to the work, we are servants of God. Let us follow the path that our master hath drawn. With the balm of his counsel, our strength to renew. Let us do with our might what our hands find to do. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and let it till the Master comes. To the work, to the work, let the hungry be fed. To the mountain of life, let the weary be led. In the cross of its banner, our glory shall be. Where we're herald, the time in salvation is free. Toy me on, toy me on, toy me on, toy me on. Our dwelling shall be, and we shout with the ransom, salvation is free. Toiling on, toiling on, toiling on, toiling on. Let us hope, let us watch, and labor till the Master let me share with you from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as we are called to one hope, you are calling one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now, I'm going to ask you to stretch your legs a little bit, stand up here, and we're going to sing the chorus, God Will Make a Way, if you would. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength, for each new day, He will make a way. He will make a way. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Hold me and make me, this is what I pray. 
Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You pray with me. God, we're thankful tonight just as we, we come together in this place, Father, for this special service tonight, Father, for ordination for our, our, our friend and our brother, Mark Hurst, God. We're just uh, very grateful for, for him uh, accepting this challenge and stepping forward to, to, uh, into, this, into this place, Father, to, to be a, a servant for you, a servant for your kingdom, Father, and to, and to serve the church. Uh, in this way, Father. We just uh, are, are grateful to be a part of this time tonight, God. We just, as the song we sang tonight just now, it gives evidence of a, of a heart and a life that is, that is changed by God and that he's allowed God to, to mold his heart and, and into who he is today, God, and we're thankful for that. Father, we just again just are, pray for your presence and for this, this time tonight, Father, just to be, uh, to be sweet in your spirit tonight, God, and we just... Uh, Again, pray your blessings upon those who participate, upon Mark as he shares with us, and upon the speakers who share uh, with the church tonight as well. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated now, and again, just want to take this time to welcome you tonight to the service, the ordination service, for again, for Mother Mark Hurst uh, this evening, and just, uh, again, just uh, uh, pray that be, we share this time together, that you'll be blessed by it, and as I know I will, and I, I pray that you will be as well. Mother Dick? All right, thank you. This one, okay. I have returned to the God of my childhood, to the same simple faith. As a child I once knew, like the prodigal son, I longed for the loved ones, for the comforts of home, and the God I outgrew. I have returned to the God of my childhood. Bethlehem's babe, the prophet's Messiah, he's Jesus to me, eternal deity, praise his name, I have returned, I have returned. To the God of my mother With unfailing faith For the child of her heart She said bring them up The way that you want them Thank God when they're grown They'll never depart I have returned to the God of my mother. I learned at her knee. He's the lily of the valley. Jesus to me, eternal deity. Praise his name. I have returned, I have returned to the God of my father, the most godlike man a child could know. I just heard a shout from the angels in glory, praising the Lord. A child has come home. I have returned to the God of my father. 
creator of heaven and earth, God of the universe, he's Jesus to me, eternal deity, oh praise his name, I have returned, I have returned to the Yahweh of Judah, on my knees I did fall, where the wall once stood, this lesson I've learned, as I've worked my way homeward, the Savior of all is a comfort to man. I have returned to the father of Abraham, the shepherd of Moses, who called him the great I am. He's Jesus to me, eternal deity, praise his name, I have returned, oh praise his name, I have returned. Thank you, Brother Dick. I wish I could sing. That was not one of my talents that the Lord um, gave me. He gave me many other ones, but singing is not one. Ask my wife. Thank you for being here on this very, very important occasion as we welcome another servant into service. I am Adolfo de Montalvo. I'm one of your deacons serving in here, and I have uh, the privilege uh, to welcome another member uh, into our fold. We, the Deacon Body of Middle Grove Baptist Church, have, it, have examined and approved Mark Hurst for Deacon Ministry according to the biblical qualifications of Acts chapter 6, verse 3, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 through 13, do unanimously recommend Mark to the church for ordination into the Deacon Ministry by the laying of hands. But before we're going to have the privilege of having Mark give us a short testimony. Brother Mark. Right here. I grew up in a small town in north central Washington state called Tenasket, about 19 miles from uh, British Columbia border. I uh, grew up in our town was about 1,500. Uh, other small towns around us were even smaller. Um, my parents sent me to church. Uh, they sent me to a Lutheran church that I went to from a very young age. Um, one of the pastor's wives told me when I was in high school later on that I had had an experience when I was about three that I accepted the Lord then but I didn't I didn't remember that and uh, I made a profession of faith when I was um, about six and I was baptized when I was eight and um, I went through catechism uh, our catechism study was on the Lord's Prayer that was one of the first real teachings I think I had in the Bible was my catechism. Um, the Lutheran church that I went to was a liturgical church. You um, sang songs and you uh, were asked questions and you responded. And I don't remember any of the sermons um, talking to me or speaking to me. Um, Later on, when I was in, in high school, 
a friend of mine uh, who was also my best man uh, helped lead me to the Lord. He took me to several meetings and uh, one night in an Assembly of God church I accepted the Lord. And I was very afraid and, and fearful that night because I didn't know what I was accepting into. I was, what if, what if I'm asking the devil into my heart? But it wasn't, I trusted my friends and I, I knew that I did the right thing. And I was on fire that summer. Um, my friends and I, we changed sprinklers, big long 20 feet foot poles, you plug in, twist and go to the next one. Um, we um, sang songs and praised God all day long. I, I thought this is, this is what it's about. And, uh, but I, I didn't read my Bible. I didn't read my Bible. And uh, I wasn't grounded very well. And when I was about 20, I joined the Free Methodist Church and we had really good teaching there. And we, um, I participated in men's groups and men's studies. And uh, I was involved in a, a group for people, singles my age, it was the closest thing we had to a youth group. And um, I really enjoyed that church. And I felt like I was on the edge of something, but I, I just, wasn't there yet. Um, I, um, I went to college several times. I, I finally, when I was 24, I joined the Navy. And uh, I went off to join the Navy and uh, uh, went to boot camp. Um, went to boot camp with my current brother-in-law. Um, the my wife's twin sister was married to, to him. <laughs> we were in the same company. I started writing to her, and uh, we started communicating via letters and, and phone, and I went to visit her a couple times, and uh, I think we were married within a year's time. Correct me? About a year and a half. And uh, we've been married 35 years, and we have four children. Rachel, who's 30, Garrett is 21, Matthew and Aaron are uh, 18, going on 19. They'll be 19 in December. Um, we first started attending here in the early 2000s, I'm going to say 2002. To, uh, because I know Garrett w was about three at the time. M Mr. Court was his, his adopted grandpa at the time, and, and Garrett loved coming here, and he loved Mr. Court. And uh, later on, uh, we got involved in Sunday school here, and I think that, that has been very important to me because it helped me get in the Word. And we, had, we have good pastors here who teach the word, and, and that's really important, too. And uh, um, I teach Sunday school now. Uh, I derailed my train of thought. Um, we've been married for 35 years. Oh, we've been here since about 2002. In 2008, my daughter asked me to be baptized with her. And I was full immersion baptism at the bay. And I think that was kind of a, a, a recommitment for me. And I read the, the Bible through that year. And um, you know, I, I think it's really important that, the, that we read the word. It's important that we ground ourselves so that we we have that hope that we need, that we have that guidance we need from, from God's word. And uh, we ask for that wisdom that we need because we're, we're very deficit in that department, at least I am. <laughs> um, I appreciate everybody 
that I've uh, benefited from their service here, um, Horace, Larry, uh, Chris, um, piano player, <laughs> Melissa, I'm sorry, I have a Joe Biden brain. Uh, um, I've been I've benefited a lot from all of of, of you guys' faith and advice and um, sometimes criticism, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to serve here. And uh, you've blessed me much. Thank you very much. Serve the Lord with gladness. That hymn. Stand if you wouldn't. Let's sing this hymn together. in our works and ways come before his presence with our songs of praise unto him our maker we would pledge anew life's supreme devotion to service true serve him with gladness enter his courts with song our Creator, true praises belong. Great is His mercy, wonderful is His name. We gladly serve Him, His great love proclaim. Serve the Lord with gladness, this shall be our theme. As we walk together in His love supreme, listening, ever listening for the still small voice, His sweet, sweet, precious will be our choice. Serve Him with gladness, enter His courts with song. Our Creator, true praises belong. Great is His mercy, wonderful is His name. We gladly serve Him, His great love proclaim. Amen. Have a seat, please, Pastor. for being here tonight to support Mr. Mark. I want to ask the question tonight, why do we need deacons? Why is that something that the church does, participates in, seeks? Jesus saved his last teaching moment with his disciples before the crucifixion to emphasize servanthood. Think about what it means to be a servant. John 13, 12 through 17 says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place. Now you have to take, in that, take that into context and think about what had just happened. Jesus, the Creator, the Lord of heaven and earth, came to be born of a virgin, to live on this earth, to walk among us, to suffer the same things that we suffer, to go through the same things we go through, the trials that we face. He lived some 30-something years and knowing that he's about to go to the cross, desired to have the last supper with his disciples in the upper room. And he asked John and another disciple to prepare that. They put it all, they brought it all in. And one of the items that Jesus had asked for is a bowl, a basin, and a pitcher of water. And he poured the water into the basin. And then with a towel began to wash the disciples' feet. The creator, the sustainer of heaven and earth chose the form of a servant. 
And the Bible says in verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Deacons are an essential part of the ministry of the church. The word deacon means servant in the New Testament. Literally what the word means is table waiter. Deacons minister to widows and elderly and shut-ins. Deacons oversee the ministries of the church. But most importantly, deacons set the example of what a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ should look like. I want us to look now in Acts chapter 6 and see the first group of deacons for just a moment and, and their qualification. And then we'll hear what Paul has to say in 1 Timothy chapter 3 for just a moment. But looking at Acts chapter 6, I want us to see the occasion for the call of the first set of deacons. Listen to what it says in verse 1. Now, in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Notice in verse 1, the problem happened when the church was growing. Can I say this with gladness in my heart? We have a growing, thriving church. Amen? Amen? And we need deacons. And so this, this is happening now. We're not seeing the exponential growth that they were seeing in that day. But a growing, healthy, thriving church needs deacons. Okay? But secondly... There was a complaint. There was a complaint in the church. Notice what it says. A complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So there was an issue. Deacons were first called to bring unity to the church. And that's the role of a deacon. That's one of the reasons why we need deacons to help maintain the unity. Jesus in, it, in that last prayer that he prayed in the garden, John chapter 17, he prayed earnestly that we would be one, even as he and the Father were one. So Jesus is concerned about the unity of his church. A broken, fractured church is in absolutely no position to reach the loss for Christ. But a unified church, listen, there is nothing that can stop a church unified for the kingdom and glory of God. And deacons are essential in that process. And the Bible said, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church when his church is built, founded upon the rock. Not a fractured church founded on the sand, but a solid church founded on the rock. Notice that it was also a cultural Dispute. We might even say a racial dispute. The Hellenists, those who embraced Hellenistic culture, and then those other Jewish Christians who really embraced their Jewishness. And those two things collided in the church. And deacons were brought on to bring that unity, to mend that divide in between those two. To bring peace and unity and harmony in the church. Now notice where deacons come from. 
It says in verse 2, the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples. Now notice, these twelve, we're talking about the original eleven minus Judas, add Matthias, are the twelve, and now they represent the council, the ordaining council of the church. It's, this is their idea. And these guys, notice that all twelve of these guys spent their uh, three and a half years walking with Jesus. So they understood what was right about doctrine and what is right about our ecclesia, our gathering of Christians, our church, how to do church. If you want to know how to do church, you ask these guys. Because they had heard from Jesus directly. And deacons are their idea. They're the ones that said the church needs deacons. And then they called the rest of the disciples. I want you to see fifthly though, these were selected to be servants of the church while the apostles were ordained, ordained to preach. So the deacons were selected to serve, wait tables. It doesn't seem like very glamorous, glorious work. It's servanthood. The deacons were selected to do that and the apostles were to continue to preach. Now Paul tells us some are ordained to be deacons, some are ordained to be apostles, some are ordained to do different things, various things. We all have a different gift. I'm thankful for Mr. Horace reminding us of that tonight. Not to be jealous of one another's gifts, because we're all different. We've all been called to a different thing. However, I want to point this out to you. If it weren't for deacons, the pastor of any sizable church could never fulfill his calling. In other words, the ministers of the gospel cannot preach the gospel without deacons. Deacons were selected to support the gospel ministry. And then look at the description of the type of men that they were to, that they were to be. Therefore, verse 3, brothers, pick out from among you seven men. Here's the first qualification of good repute. In other words, a good reputation. Somebody that people look up to in the church. I want you to understand, Mr. Mark, that this church is ordaining you because God has revealed you as a servant already. You're already a deacon. We're just affirming what God has already said about you in this service. You're serving the Lord with gladness right now. And you, your reputation precedes you in that. A good reputation, moral excellence, credibility and respect among the community of faith. That was their characteristics. But secondly, that they had a strong walk with the Lord. Notice what it says, they were full of the Spirit. And if you go on and you read on down through chapter 6 and into chapter 7, and you read about these men and the kind of men that they were and what they did, you see that Stephen was a man that was full of faith and of wisdom and of power. And this man Stephen, he went on to stand up before the Sanhedrin and proclaim Christ. He took the Old Testament and he basically gave a, a, a biblical theology, a run through, all the way through the Old Testament all the way down to Christ to say, now the Spirit of God is living inside of all those who believe in Christ, and they stoned him to death for that testimony. I mean, the first deacon became the first martyr. And then you look in the next one that we know of, what happened to him that Acts talks about, is Philip. Philip went to Samaria and began preaching the Word of God everywhere he went. And he was even performing miracles there and people were believing. They were having revival in Samaria. And then God said, Philip, I want you to go down to this desert road. Go down to this desert road. And so Philip began his journey, leaving the revival behind where God was doing amazing things because Philip had a servant's heart, and he was willing to obey the Spirit of God. And then the Spirit said to Philip, go up to this chariot. And he went up to the chariot, and the Ethiopian eunuch, a high court official of Candace, was reading from the book of Isaiah. 
the exact spot that we believe is the, the greatest messianic text where it says he was pierced. And then Philip says to him, do you understand what you're reading? He says, no, unless somebody tells me. And then Philip opens up his mouth and begins to share Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch believes in Christ and is, is baptized right there on the road. And then from Christian history, you understand that now that man went back to Ethiopia and shared Christ. There were Before the first Christian missionaries ever got to Ethiopia, there was a, a church there founded in Ethiopia because of this unit. And then the Bible says that God took, the Spirit of God took Philip away. And we don't know what that means exactly. Whatever happened to Philip, nobody really knows. But you see that these two men, the two examples that God gives us, is that these two men were full of the Spirit. And you've already testified about how you believe we become full of the Spirit. It's by getting in the Word of God and spending time with Him. And walking and living according to His Word. And that's how we keep in step with the Spirit. And you've testified that before all of us, and we see that that's true about you. And so, they had a deep walk with the Lord, and then thirdly, their reliability. Their reputation, their relationship, and then their reliability. Look at what it says next. It says, Full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. They were appointed to the duties. Every, every year, I don't know if it's every year or is it every month, that the duty list comes out for the deacons. Every month. Every month the duty list comes out. And, and uh, our chairman has already mentioned that we've got some more pages to go in the deacon notebook. Amen? <laughs> Family ministry. We're going to begin here. It's work. It's a duty. It's serving. But we believe that because you've already proven to be a hard worker, a laborer for the Lord, that you will fulfill your duty. And we trust you. And we trust all of these ordained deacons in this church. That's the reason why you serve as deacons is because you are reliable. We can count on you. We know that you will show up day in and day out and you will fulfill the ministry of this church that has been assigned to you. And we're thankful for you. And Mr. Mark, we're thankful that you are willing to step in to that service and to be called a deacon of Myrtle Grove Baptist Church. But not just Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for that. I want to pray for you now. Father, I just thank you so much for Mr. Mark's willingness. I thank you, Father, for the example of the deacons, the first deacons that we have before us, and how you use them. And Lord, I pray that the gospel ministry would continue to thrive here at Myrtle Grove Baptist Church because men of good repute, who are full of the Spirit and of wisdom, and who will be faithful to carry out their duties, have stepped up to the plate to serve as deacons. But we'll give you the credit and the glory because you served us first. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we now have some responsive reading for... Uh our service tonight, I'll read uh, a portion, I'll read the first portion, and then uh, you will read the, uh, the smaller, I'll read the smaller print to begin, and then you read the larger print uh, responsively afterwards. It says that he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Do your best. Adventures. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain.
Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. As each of us has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good shepherds, as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as the one who speaks oracles of God. God bless the reading of his word. And now we come to the portion of our service where we will lay hands on Mr. Mark. And all of the ordained men will be asked to come. But Mr. Mark, we'd ask you to come and sit here. Thank you, sir. I'll ask all the ordained men if they would make their way to the front. When we lay on the hands, this is a representation of the passing on of the torch or of the Spirit of God. The ordination represents the gifting of God, the blessing of God coming upon this man in order to fulfill his duty. Because what we understand is from the Word of God, we don't operate in our own strength. We don't serve in our own strength. We just read, not according to us, but according to His strength and His power do we serve. And so that's why we lay on the hands.
It is a great privilege to bring a charge to the church tonight. I called the pastor and wanted to verify what passage he was using, and we were selecting the same passages. And so I'm going to continue on with the passage in, in Acts 6. And of course, backing up a little bit to verse 3, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit of the wisdom, and, and whom we will appoint to the duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurius, and Nicandor, and Timon, and Fermius, and Nicholas, and the proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them as we have just done with our brother Mark. And the word of the God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Well, there was a lot of things that we can see here in this passage, and I'm here just to bring a charge to those of us here and to our church that we know that God has called men like our pastor, Josh, and our staff, and our deacons, and all of us have a calling on our lives, as I already mentioned tonight. And those in leadership at times can accept the position and the responsibility and unfortunately, sometimes they can translate it into a position of power. And it's not what the deacon ministry is about. And it's a ministry to come alongside of, of our pastor and our staff. And uh, in a sense, hold hands with them and pray with them and, and work beside them and ease their load. Because a pastor can only do so much. His calling is to, to prepare messages that, will, that God has led him to, that will minister to us, to help us to go out and minister to others. Our staff give him support. And so deacons need to come alongside, and the rest of us as well as the church, to minister and to help people find Christ and to minister to those who have need. And so we want to make sure that every person that has a position, whether it's committee or uh, deacon or anything, realizes it's not just a position of, of, of power in a sense, but a responsibility to minister to the congregation, to the members of the church. And so we need to pray that they would have wisdom not to abuse this power, and that it would, God would use them in a mighty way. So three things I want just to cover tonight, very briefly. Pray for them, encourage them, and follow them. Speaking of our deacons and our yoke fellows. Churches should pray for the deacons and yoke fellows in our congregation. And I want to challenge you as a, as a congregation to pray for those who serve in these capacities. The New Testament church was born out of prayer. After Christ arose, the disciples, which would meant the 120 in the upper room, were praying until the Pentecost came when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And Peter preached, and 3,000 souls were added to the church. And so the church was born on the wings of prayer. And we must be a praying church if we're going to see God work mightily in our midst. There's nothing more important than to pray for the person, including deacons and yoke fellows. Someone said, if you depend upon organization, you'll get what organizations will do. If you depend upon money, you'll get what money will provide. If you depend upon education, you do, you'll get what education can do. But if you depend upon promotion, you'll get what promotion will do. But if, but if you depend on prayer, you get what God can do. 
And we need to be a praying church, and, and we need to lift up our pastor. We need to lift up our, our deacons and yoke fellows, and we need to lift up our staff, and, and we need to lift up those in, in all of our leadership positions and one another, all of us. We need to spend time in prayer for, for each of us that God would use uh, Myrtle Grove Baptist Church as, as a membership to, to be a lighthouse to this area. So the second thing is the church should encourage its deacons and yoke fellows. Serving alongside the pastor, serving the church, witnessing to the world is no easy task. But if we spend a lot of time fulfilling their responsibilities and wrestling with the hard issues the church is dealing with, uh, they don't need a, a criticism. They need to be encouraged along the way. One of the greatest things Satan uses is discouragement. Uh, so pray for uh, our leadership and, and our deacons and yoke fellows and our pastor and staff. Because a lot of times when we're on the, the, the uh, trail of ministry and doing what God has called us to do, Satan's right there trying to stop us from being effective. And surely they, they don't need more discouragement from the church either. So we need to have... Uh, the church folks to encourage uh, one another as we go forward as well as the leadership of our church. And thirdly, the church should follow the leadership of our deacons and yoke fellows. Now, I'm not asking you to blindly follow them, but, but uh, you know, it, 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 hopefully our deacons, when, when they sense the leadership of God, would pray over what they feel and they need to bring before the body and that the, the deacons would handle things in an appropriate way as God would lead us. And, and that means that the church should be open to uh, what the deacons and, and our pastor and all bring before our church and spend that time in prayer and to ask God for leadership. Because many times, uh, as well, sometimes um, it can be that some people just don't want to be open to uh, what God may have for the church because they like things the way they've always been. <laughs> and it's hard sometimes to, to, to listen and to be obedient to what God is leading to do. Because if we keep doing the same thing the same way all the time, we'll get the same results. And sometimes God's got a new work he wants us to do. And sometimes he speaks through our pastor and our staff and sometimes through our deacons and yoke fellows and sometimes through each one of you. So we need to say in prayer and, and that we would uh, sense the leadership at what God is leading the leadership to do and to pray over those things and work together for that unity that has already been mentioned tonight. One well, of the most blessed churches are the churches with the gifted leaders. And the church is blessed with leaders who love and serve the Lord and the congregation. Our duty is to pray for them, encourage them, and follow them. And so tonight... We want to spend this time next. We want to pray um, not only with over Mark, but his precious wife, Louise. Okay, can you both of you come up at this point? And we're going to ask Mark to sit back down in the chair, and we have a uh, stool that you can be right beside him. And we want to ask the ladies specifically, as well as any other church member that would like to come down, we're going to pray over them, okay, right now. Would you like to come? Dude, why don't you come on up here, guys, and stand yeah. right back here behind your dad. Good, good. You take charge, brother. Okay. And so this is going to be our, our last act of ordination is the church's confirmation. Is you saying you're going to love them, you're going to pray for them, you're going to encourage them, and you're going to listen to them and be led by them. And uh, this new deacon is no exception. Mark, we're thankful for you, brother. And so uh, if you feel so led, you can just reach your hand out or you can just reach your hand toward them. Put your hand on somebody's shoulder tonight if you want to. And we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, God, we realize that we are in your presence now and that you are accomplishing greater things than we can ever possibly imagine even now. Lord, we 
are your servants. We belong to you. The question is whether we'll be a good servant or not. And we believe with all of our hearts that Mr. Mark is going to serve you with gladness and the strength that you provide. And as a church, we want to come alongside him and we want to serve as well. Work hard for the kingdom of God to seek you first. And Father, we know that you love us. You loved us enough that not only did you serve us, not only did you set the example of servanthood, you took your body to the cross. You stretched your hands out wide. You shed your blood. You died for us. Because, Lord, we were sinners needing to be rescued. And Father, that message must be proclaimed. Lord, not only did you die, you rose again and you're alive today. And you promised to send your spirit so that, Lord, we don't have to do this alone. Your church doesn't have to accomplish this task alone. But what you want is willingness and cooperation. And so, Lord, we willingly submit to your work. We submit to who you are. And, Lord, we lay our lives down for you, the one who laid it all down for us. Lord Jesus, that you might be glorified in and through your church. That's what our desire is. And so, Father, take us now. Use us. Take Mr. Mark. Take Miss Louise. Take his children and use them for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's just stand where we are. for just, You can back up social distance if you need to. Lead us in the song, brother. After presentation of... Oh, okay, we've got to present that. Let's do that first. You can go back to your seats for a moment. We'll present that. we get the camera in here. Come on. Oh, me? Oh, okay. Sorry. Amen. Miss Louise, you want to squeeze in? Okay. Cover that up a little bit. <laughs> All right, amen. Amen. Now we're going to sing our We're hymn. standing on holy ground. <clears throat> now we need to stand to sing this one. Cup on your feet, gang. We are standing on holy ground. And I know that there are angels all around let us praise Jesus now we are standing in his presence on holy ground amen Father, we thank you so much for your presence tonight. And Lord, as we go out, and Lord, we take with us your Holy Spirit into the world, I pray that the world would see you living in us. And Lord, bring us back here at the next appointed time that we may gather in your name and worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. There are some snacks and refreshments in the fellowship hall. So, uh, finger foods, so be careful your fingers are clean, okay? There you go. That